Hello, everyone. We'll be with you shortly. We're just waiting for a few more attendees to arrive. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, another edition of uh, Tea at Three on Wednesdays. We're thrilled this week to be talking about one of the places I really, really want to go, Sable Island. But first I have to do a little housekeeping items. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be sent to you if you weren't able to attend or listen to the entire uh, uh, broadcast. It'll be uh, sent to you to re-listen later or to send on to your friends or clients. And uh, the other thing is, uh, if you want to ask us any questions, please put the question in the question and answer box and we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So today I have a very old friend, good friend, uh, Fred Stillman, your expedition leader and going over to Sable Island. Fred started off uh, his career uh, in the travel business with us so many years ago. And uh, he was a tour guide and went into our sales office and did lots of things with us. And now he's out doing uh, the loves of his life, out hiking and uh, kayaking and doing these uh, great trips over to Sable Island. So Fred, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk with you and catch up with the folks from uh, from Atlantic Tours. Um, yeah, that's where I started my career in uh, tourism, and uh, from there, it's really grown quite a bit. Um, Kajik Expeditions, which is my company now, uh, offers quite a number of different uh, tours, um, but Sable Island seems to be the most popular trip that we offer, and it's really. Um, the direction that the company is heading in now is really focusing, you know, I wouldn't say only on Sable, but primarily on Sable Island trips. So we've provided you with a map there uh, for the folks to see where Sable Island is. And I'll just jump back to that, Fred, uh, yep. so people get an idea where it's located off of Nova Scotia. Yeah, it's about 300 kilometers from Halifax, Nova Scotia, about 185 from Canso. Nova Scotia. It sits, um, it's a terminal moraine, which means it was created by glacial action about 10,000 years ago, uh, debris that was pushed up and left sort of, it would have been a lot bigger at the time and it's, it's shrunk since then, but um, it sits very close to the edge of the continental shelf and that's where the ocean depth drops dramatically. Um, it's also where the Gulf Stream comes up and, and rides along the, the continental shelf, so it changes a lot of weather out there. Um, and it is a very, it's, it's essentially just a sandbar, but it's a 40 kilometer sandbar, um, about 1.5 kilometers at its widest point, uh, has a variety of vegetation, uh, a lot of grass, the grass is super important. And right now there are about, about 500 horses, wild horses that have been there, uh, not these particular horses, but horses have been there since 1750s. Um, oh, and how, how are we getting there, Fred? <laughs> are we getting there? Well, we go by airplane, helicopter, and ship. And there's a, an example of the helicopter that... Uh, yeah, that, that picture actually shows me opening, uh, cracking a bottle of champagne. And, you know, officially, you're not supposed to have alcohol at uh, national parks, but um, they, uh, they usually <laughs> let us have our champagne there uh, at the end of the day. It's a pretty special day. It's a hard place to get to. It takes a lot of work to get there. Um, but we've seemed to really nail it down well. So we're very, you know, all of our trips are very successful. So and so what is the total amount that we can take on the helicopter? Uh, myself plus seven, uh, seven guests. Okay. Now there is another option by plane as well. Um, yeah, plane is one less seat. Uh, so it's myself plus six. Um, the plane, the plane is great. It, uh, it's a little bit less expensive, but it also has its uh, challenges as well. The, the plane lands on the sand. So landing on sand is difficult. The sand has to be of the right consistency. Uh, it can't be too dry and it can't be too wet. When I see you're approaching the island here in this shot. Yeah, it's in the helicopter, yeah. Yeah, that uh, helicopter that we charter uh, is a, a twin engine uh, Sikorsky S76 A++. Uh, it has two pilots. Uh, it's an offshore uh, helicopter. And, being and, how long, and how long is it again to get out there by helicopter? Uh, heading out is typically about an hour and 15 minutes and back is about an hour and 30 minutes. Uh, that's just because of the predominant wind direction. So just say an hour and a half. Wonderful, wonderful. 
uh, to a great view of the island from there. Now, what would be the highest point on the island? Uh, just... uh, it's about uh, 80 feet. Look at the beach, it's stunning. Yeah, and that beach changes almost weekly, believe it or not. The Depending island changes. A little bit in currents. And, and during major storms, I'm assuming there's a, a huge storm sur surge that would come over parts of the island as well. Very much so. Now, what we're looking at here is the north side. And the north side has a lot of the dunes. Uh, they're much steeper on that side. And you can see these little channels that go through. They're called blowouts. And those are from storms and stuff that come in from the north and just wash water in and wash sand out. And they create these blowouts. Um, this picture is one of the spits. I suspect this is a west, west spit. Um, there's no vegetation on the spits. Uh, lots of seals, typically. And the horses, they don't spend a lot of time where there's not a lot of vegetation. But once in a while, for some reason, they, they just kind of congregate out there. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. The leader of the pack, I guess. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, the herd itself, about 500. But there are several bands. There's about 50 or 60 bands of horses. And they can range from five to 10 to 12 horses per band. That's us uh, sitting around the Sable Island National Park sign. Uh, horses, of course, in the background. Uh, seems pretty much everywhere we go on these tours, we run into quite a few horses, so it's nice. So maybe Fred, uh, while, while we're looking at this picture, and we're gonna let the pictures just uh, go through and we'll we'll jump in where, where we need to, but maybe you can tell us about the, how the experience all works from the time you uh, leave Halifax and, and what happens when we get there. Yep, for sure. Um, first of all, it's a very long day. So the day starts at sunrise, essentially. Um, we make our way to, if it's a helicopter trip, for example, uh, we make our way to uh, Visionaire Services, the company that we charter the helicopters from. And uh, we meet there approximately 6.45, 6.30 a.m. Uh, right now there is a COVID protocol uh, information we have to fill out. Every, every guest has to do that. Uh, we go over a safety briefing for the helicopter. Uh, we get into the helicopter, we buckle up properly, um, make our way, we land at Sable Island at about 8.30, 9, uh, 9 o'clock. It's different at different times of the year. Um, that's main station right there. Nice, yeah, I was gonna say uh, that's the main. Yeah, so it's about an hour and a half to the, to the island. We land there. Once we land at the helipad, uh, Parks Canada staff joins us and they provide us with a briefing on the island, um, like a, you know an introduction to the island and, uh, and the rules. And I mean, they know we're very familiar with each other and they know me very well. And they, you know, they're quite happy with me just operating autonomous on the island. So we don't have to have park staff go with us. Um, although they will join us from time to time to give us some new information, which is really helpful and really nice. Um, once we land, uh, we're walking around the island. Uh, we don't have vehicle transport on the island. Um, it's all by foot. And uh, depending on what the recent patterns are for horses, then we typically operate the, the walking route um, to where the more recently familiar place, uh, places that have been known to have more horses because everybody wants to see them, so. Well, these uh, ones look like they pose for us here. <laughs> yeah, no, believe it or not, that's taken with quite a far lens. Oh, this I, I took a picture of this uh, little smiling harbor seal. Um, harbor seals there tend to be at this color. Um, they'd be more of a really darker color if you see them in Halifax, but this is a harbor seal. Um, it looks pretty happy, kind of just hanging out in the sun. And they tend to congregate a little bit on North Beach. So we see them you know, usually by midday or the end of the day. And as but, far as what you would bring with you? Um, uh, so yeah, people, you know, it's uh, you can't bring too much because everything is done sort of by there's a weight, there's a weight limit in terms of our baggage. So uh, we have to make sure that we're not bringing like 50 pounds of stuff. So we really try to keep everyone around 15 pounds or less of equipment. Uh, a lot of people want to bring, you know, heavier cameras and stuff. But um, yeah, a windbreaker, uh, sunscreen, a hat, sunglasses, those are hugely important things. Um, if you're on any medications, then we always suggest people bring enough for a few days because it's possible to get stuck there. And I see some people there walking and with the horses in the forefront. And uh... yeah, that's one of our groups. Uh, that was Sandy Shark. He had moved around to the other side and took a picture of it. Um, this is the Mamachug Pond. So this is on the western uh, portion of the main area, like the center of the island. And there are ponds there that are named after the mamachuck fish. The, that fish can survive in salt water, fresh water, mixed water, winters, shallow water. It's really a robust little fish, but that's primarily fresh water. And that is a, a watering hole for many of the horses on the island. 
Well, I suppose that would be a very important thing to have fresh water for the horses, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And those ponds do dry up. And because there's a certain level of salinity in them, for fre there are fresh water, but they do have some salinity. But as they dry up, that salinity becomes a little more concentrated. So the horses don't always drink from there in the peak of the summer, but they typically do. But there is another way that horses can get water on the island. Now, I'm assuming that the horses have to sustain themselves out there, or, or is it, um, is there feed provided, or, or things if times are, are particularly dry, or? No, they are considered a naturalized wild species, so they are on their own, just like you wouldn't feed moose or deer or coyotes or any other wild animal. You wouldn't uh, provide any uh, maintenance for the for the horses whatsoever. Um, if you do that, then you just have to do that forever because the you know it's there's no longer the survival of the fittest. That's right. See, I see you. You've taken a picture of someone taking a picture. <laughs> yeah, that's a friend of mine, uh, Mark St. Ellis. He was on uh, on the very first trip we did. That was back in 2017. Some more great shots of the horses. Yeah. Now, as far as um, uh, mobility, I mean, how mobile do you have to be to do this trip? Uh, we ask that everybody be able to walk eight to 10 kilometers a day. Okay. We don't rush anyone. It's never a hurried trip. Um, it's really very leisurely and, you know, we know the spots to go to so it's not like we're out searching for horses all day um and we try and provide a walk that's both scenic and informative and you know you get to see everything you can see in a day on the island um so you know this times we will make little loops uh, and use main station as a base uh because it is very centralized um yeah. so if someone's not a long walker it's fine if they want to take an hour and sit in a lawn chair on a beach you know not so, so that's not that's not an issue then if someone wants not, to do that. that's a good, we, we don't want to scatter people around but if they want if you know a person a guest or so wanted to sit on in a lawn chair on a beach we'd give them a radio uh just so if they need anything they can get in touch now if uh the horses approach you is there a, a pro proper etiquette that you suggest and yeah proper etiquette is that you maintain a 20 meter distance um it's not always possible but uh that is the that is the park rule if horses come up uh, then it's our duty to, to step back. Okay. They're pretty mild mannered like this. You know, they're really a very gentle group of horses. They don't have any predators. Um, their whole focus is their own preservation and existence. So they eat a lot and drink a lot of water. Why? Well, and they look, they, they don't look like they're starving by any no, stretch. They, done well, um, you know, and it's, it's interesting. Uh, this year, there's about 500 horses last year. There were about, well, two years ago, there was uh, 570, but there wasn't a big, like a whole bunch of them dying so much at once, rather than there were less, there were less, more, there were less births. Okay. So we just had the first uh, full born uh, this year. Uh, it was just uh, earlier this week. So the first full of the year was born just on Monday, I think. Well, I think that goes hand in hand. I think nature looks after itself and sometimes reproductive wise, if there's not enough, it uh, it tends yeah. to work that way. Here's a yeah. group of seals. Okay. Like even even the you know with with less food and less water, um, the, the the mares will be less fertile. Interesting. Now these are gray seals. Now the, the little white one that we saw was a harbor seal. These are gray seals, and there are actually it's the largest gray seal colony in the world. There are three hundred thousand uh, seals there. I just got back from eleven days on the island. Uh, doing a beach uh, monitoring survey with the Sable Island Institute, which is a science organization. It's actually a science and arts organization, but they are based on the island. So they uh, asked me to go and participate in this uh, uh, research that's taking place on the island, and as well as trained me to operate, um, to conduct some of this research on my own. So obviously there are some facilities there for you to stay in and... Uh... Yeah, I was in the, what's called the triplex. So there's uh, three buildings uh, attached to each other, it's, it's attached themselves like a duplex, but there's three. Um, and uh, then there's uh, there's the main station, uh, BizQ, which is visitor's quarters. Uh, there is another area for park staff. Um, there is another building that used to be a hydrogen production uh, uh, building, which was meant to launch uh, weather balloons that that process stopped last year after 75 years. It was put on by the Meteorological Service of Canada. Um, there's also a carpentry shop and a garage, generator room. 
So is there, is there is there a weather station of sorts still there? Yeah, or? there's still some. Yeah, there is a, a building that has weather uh, weather station on it for sure. Um, and you'll interesting thing is all the buildings are separated, and you you know you wonder why they are, and that's because there's no fire department on Sable Island. If one building caught on fire, they would want it well away from the other buildings. Now, as far as being there for the day, I know that you provide a nice lunch for everyone, and yeah. tell us a little bit about that. And yeah, for sure. So. Uh, with COVID, we did have to start making our lunches in separate containers for each individual person, which is fine because we used to have more of a, I don't know, you want to call it like a large charcuterie. We would sit around at a table and share a lot of different foods and it was really nice. Um, but now still typically um, it's a similar type of food, but it's all separated up into little individual containers for each person. Uh, we have a registration form and we ask people about any dietary concerns or major dislikes. So we take all of that into accommodation. But it's typically smoked salmon, uh, usually two kinds. So we have cold and, and warm smoked salmon, uh, some prosciutto, uh, avocado, uh, almonds, uh, berries, uh, local breads, uh, about three different types of cheeses. Uh, it's really a, a really nice, fulfilling, flavorful Everything we use is local as much as possible. The avocados aren't local, but uh, everything's local, local herbs, uh, everything's as organic as possible. So it's really a delicious, healthy lunch. When we started these trips, we wanted to really wow people. And we were bringing these big uh, braised lamb lunches and everybody it would eat after lunch and they wouldn't want to walk anywhere. So, <laughs> so we decided to make it a really flavorful, delicious, healthy lunch that wasn't over overpowering, wasn't overfilling. So it's a very nice lunch. Well, that's uh, certainly uh, wonderful. Now, another um, thought is uh, facilities. Are there like washroom facilities? How is that handled there? Yeah. So there is a uh, part of the uh, visitors queue at Main Station has a washroom and sunroom. And with COVID stuff happening, like with the protocols in place for COVID, we are given the sunroom and an indoor washroom. So that is ours for the day that we're there. Um, during turn season, turns are birds that come by the thousands. Uh, they are, uh, during certain times of the year, they're near the helipad. There are two helipads on the island, and one is about 750 meters away from the other. So we will land at helipad two. Um, it's really not a very long walk, but Parks Canada will actually bring out a little porta potty that they have constructed out to uh, near helipad number two so that we have it just in case someone really needs to use the bathroom when they get off the helicopter. Again, it's not a very far walk to main station. So there are and, uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing we should remind people that the helicopter ride on the way over doesn't have facilities on board either. Yeah, they can't pull <laughs> over the That's for sure. There's no washroom on there. This picture, believe it or not, is October. This is what October looks like on Sable Island. All the grasses turn this silvery shimmer. Uh, it's absolutely a stunning time of year. People always ask me, oh, is October too late in the year? And it's probably my favorite time of year. Well, it looks it looks wonderful to me. And what would the temperatures be in the summer average? I guess it could be all over the place depending on the weather, but it's, it's very moderate actually. So uh, typical temperature in June is about 15 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, in mid August, it can be 25, 27. Doesn't really get much more than that. The ocean really moderates the temperature, so it's a little it's 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 warmer in the winter and it's cooler in the summer. Okay. It's always pretty comfortable. Even I was there in March and it, was, it wasn't cold. Well, I know it's on a lot of people's uh, bucket list. And uh, uh, now I've gotten some questions here that did pop up and uh, oh, sure. I'll look at it. One was in regard to um, what happens if you can't go because of weather, monetary cancellation or those kind of things. What happens if uh, we uh, can't go? If we can't go because of weather, then we refund everybody's... Uh, uh, their, their, their payment in full. But I think your normal recommendation is to have an alternate date. I mean, or, or yeah. if you're coming, so, come for two days or whatever the case may be. That's correct. So every time we have a booking, Parks Canada gives us the following date as an alternate for weather. Um, so if, but if those two dates can't go, then then we do provide a refund, but it's, it hasn't happened. So um, yeah, so we have the, the, the first day is our main day to go. If that's looking not good for weather then we will go on the on the day following so everybody who books has to be available for both of those dates perfect that's good to know and someone else has reached out to me i guess it's a question for me uh this is a day trip uh, can we add pre and post nights absolutely we look after all of that and we can add it to any of our guaranteed departure tours our regular tours of atlantic canada this is a great uh addition to that and uh and like i said you'd be um 
we'd be looking after all the details for you. When you call and book us, we look after um, arranging everything with Fred and, uh, and we'll take it from there. So those are the yeah, couple That's of a great questions. idea. You know, I think, you know, you'd need more than a night or two really to experience Halifax, especially with you guys. You guys put together some pretty great products and packages. Yes, I always and say from a few days and I think our longest tour now of Atlantic Canada is 23 days and that would be uh, doing all the Maritimes and Newfoundland and Labrador. So ah, I always say that. that's awesome. as little or as much as you want. And one of the things in, in purchasing the company over 12 years ago now was, uh, you know, creating those more, um, um, the way I like to, to, you know, inclusive itineraries that include all the must sees and not just come in for a quick week. So, I mean, we're happy to take you for a shorter period of time, but uh, people don't realize how, how much space we have and how many wonderful things we have to do. Yeah, and the diversity in, in scenery and surroundings and culture is, uh, is really, you know, that's one of the best things about the East Coast. Exactly, sure is. It's more of those beautiful horses as we yeah. uh, continue along. Yeah. Another great thing about the latter part of the season is that uh, you know when the when the ponds are full and the and the stallions are frisky, it's like you know there's a lot of activity with the horses. Like you know the stallions will spar with each other and they run around. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's beautiful be. all year. I mean, so this is this is what I call a stable island crop circle. So in these little parts of the dunes that that hollow out. The wind circles around it'll blow the marum grass around and just keep going and it carves out like these little circles it's kind of neat. And that's what holds all of those dunes in place <laughs> that's exactly right so there's not a lot of nutrition in sand yet all this vegetation grows so a lot of that is from uh believe it or not like uh seaweed but also there's so many seals in the area that when they you know they use the washroom in the in the ocean and that stuff blows up onto the sand and then it disintegrates and then the winds carry it up into the grasses it actually fertilizes the grasses quite well yes i never thought about it that way yeah but no yeah i mean you're pretty much guaranteed a horse i would think when you when you go it's be hard, hard I not never to see want to say it, but it's never happened that we didn't see a lot because we're really we're in touch with park staff on a on a weekly sometimes bi-weekly basis as well as the scientists on the island so um you know one thing with our tours is is we want to just we don't just want to you know you know the old expression only leave footprints we actually want to give back so a portion of every tour ticket goes to the sable island institute uh to help with their research on the horses and other vegetation and uh and the research they're doing in terms of ocean health which is what i was taking part in in march Okay, and I'm assuming here is one of those uh, freshwater ponds. Or, or it is. The... That's uh, that's a pine pond number two, uh, or uh, East Pine Pond, uh, and we're just we were everybody was kind of just tired, so we decided to have a nice big sit down in the patch of bayberry, and just admire the scenery for 15 minutes and have a snack. Who doesn't want to admire the scenery? With those that's beautiful. stunning. Everywhere you look, it's beautiful. It's hard to find a spot that isn't dramatically beautiful on that island. Now, another question that's rolled in, and I always, I don't really always like this question, but you know, everything has its price. So someone's asking what the cost of these trips generally are. And, uh, and like I said, it's a day trip with a helicopter and it's to uh, uh, a spot that has limited access. And uh, so let's just say you and I aren't making the huge dollars, but, uh, but. No, you know, when you putting the trip together is an expensive endeavor. It is. You have to charter an offshore helicopter with two pilots. You have to pay landing fees, uh, licensing fees. Um, a lot of time goes into each one of these trips. I think I personally put about 50 or 60 hours into each trip. Um, and then there's everything else goes along with running the business. But uh, yeah, so they range, they range, the heli the plane trip is around 2000, 2250. The helicopter is about 3150. Ship is about uh, the four day ship trip is 5450, I think, this year, and it may go up next year because ships are expensive. So, the, the prices are uh, around 2500, I believe, is the price per person for this. Uh, yeah, 2250 for the, for the plane and 3150 for the helicopter. Exactly. So, like I said, it's one of those uh, bucket list items, and uh, you know. Uh, when I've gone places, I've, I've certainly done lots of the world now. And, and to me, everyone says, where's your favorite place? And I always say, 
right here in Atlanta, Canada. Yeah. I mean, love Nova Scotia as much as I do anywhere. And uh, this is definitely on my list uh, sometime uh, before I go and, and leave is to go over and see Sable Island. It's one of those uh, um, bucket list uh, when you got no, when you had nowhere else to go. And uh, if, even if you do, uh, right now we're locked down and we can't go on those other trips. Why not? Uh, why not enjoy what we have right in our own backyard? Yeah, for sure. A lot of people have said that this year, you know, this is the time to go because, you know, everything else is so limited. This is safe. It's within Nova Scotia even. So you're not even crossing any borders. It's someone actually else has high. asked, you mentioned, uh, but going by ship, it, what, what what does that entail? If that is that an option you had mentioned? And yeah, we have uh, we charter uh, the Leeway Odyssey, which is a 137 foot uh, aluminum ex Coast Guard research vessel. Um, so we travel from Canso. Uh, we take the boat to Canso first and we dry or everyone meets in Canso. Um, and then uh, just because it saves quite a bit of time in crossing. So it's either a 10 hour crossing or a 20 hour crossing. And most people would prefer to drive to Canso and have a 10 hour crossing. Uh, so from there, we, we leave Canso. Um, let's say it was a, uh, we would leave on a Sunday night, uh, Sunday evening, uh, we would do an introduction to the ship, uh, safety stuff, and then have dinner and do an introduction to the island uh, while we have dinner, and then uh, get a, in a reasonably early night to, to bed, and then get up. We arrive at Sable Island at about 4, 4.30 in the morning. Um, we would have an early breakfast, uh, jump in Zodiac, head to the island, this is all with, you know, communication with parks and everything to make sure everything, the landing areas are safe and all that stuff. But yeah, that's typically the, the itinerary. Land there in the morning with Zodiacs, make our way to, we usually start at Main Station and then head west. And then we go back and then we can either have lunch on the island or lunch on the ship. Some people like to have a little nap in the afternoon. Then we go back to a different, portion, different part of the island by Zodiac and, uh, you know, visit hike around and, and see the sunset, which is really nice to be able to see the sunset on Sable. Uh, and then we're back on the boat for supper and later supper up again early on the island in another area, usually head down to Bald Dune um, and then explore that area. And then again, sunset at another different area. And then we're back on the boat for supper, a late supper again, and then we overnight back to Cancel. So two full days from sunrise to sunset on the island. It's really uh, popular with photographers. And how many people does that hold? Uh, we take a max of 10 people, 10 guests. Okay. And uh, another question we've had is, are there ticks on the island? There are no ticks on the island, and we have to make sure we don't bring them there. So uh, everybody's footwear is scrubbed before we even get on the uh, helicopter. I have to do that. Uh, we also check Velcro. So if you have Velcro on your jacket or if you're, you know, in any of your clothing, we want to go through that. Just take a quick peek and make sure there's no seeds or, uh, or any ticks or anything like that hiding. Uh, so no, there are no ticks on the island. Well, Fred, I think uh, there's no more questions and I, we've kind of gone through the process and I want to thank you very much for sharing such a beautiful destination with us. And I encourage those uh, that are listening to uh, reach out to us. We'd love to book you on one of these excursions. And, uh, and once again, um, we hope to see you next week for our topic at three o'clock again. Now we're going to do Nova Scotia day trips and, uh, and getaways that are just close to uh, to uh, Halifax and the surrounding area. So we'll be doing that once again. That'll be myself uh, again. And uh, so thank you all for attending and uh, we'll be uh, following up uh, uh, with, um, with the uh, recording of this webinar and any other questions that happen to uh, roll in. So again, Frank, uh, Fred, Fred, thank you. It's good to see you again. I don't know where that came from. This is my fourth presentation today, Fred. So it's- uh, <laughs> I've only known you for 20 some years. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, folks. And thanks, Robert. I really appreciate the yes. opportunity. Oh, Richard, I'm sorry, Richard. Yes, of course. Thank you again, Fred. Right on. Good to see you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, thanks. That worked out really well. Yeah, it went by quickly.